Okay, uh, so let's get started. So uh, the title is Structurally Tractable Graph Classes. And this is, uh, well, there's no, uh, this is an invented name. It's of, of an area, of a rather new area um, on the crossroads of logic, graph theory, and algorithmics. It, it doesn't have a real name. Uh, so this is a, some ad hoc name. Um, maybe let me tell you, try to explain briefly what this is about. So there are various classes of uh, graphs, <clears throat> which turn out to be tractable um, from many perspectives, algorithmically tractable, logically tractable, and combinatorially tractable. As an example of such a class is the class of all graphs. And then there's various generalizations like the class of planar graphs or graphs of bounded tree width. Then this can be further generalized to graphs of bounded, let's say here you have bounded genus, graphs which exclude a minor, or graphs which have bounded degree. And there's, there's a map of various notions of uh, um, sparseness or structural tractability. Those, those classes over here are sparse in a sense. So all graphs uh, are, have a, a small number of edges. You can think of it as roughly the number of edges is proportional to the number of vertices rather than proportional to the square of the number of vertices as, as it is in, in general graphs. You can have, in general, you can have as many edges as this, well, roughly the square of the number of vertices. In, in, the, in sparse graph classes, you have rather a linear number of edges. So those are, uh, but that you need to impose some. No, but I think I should do that Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, those classes, uh, you, you have to impose further restrictions on those classes. It's not enough to to have a bounded number, a linear number of edges. So there are various notions which make those classes somehow tame. But there are also uh, tame classes of graphs which are not necessarily sparse. Those in include, for example, classes of bounded clique width or classes of bounded twin width. Uh, Miha will be talking about classes of bounded twin width tomorrow. And they are also still, they, are, they might be dense, so they might have a quadratic number of edges in terms of the number of vertices, but still they are algorithmically and structurally and logically tractable. So this is like a very uh, broad overview. And now I will try to explain um, what I mean by tractable. So uh, I, my main focus in this talk today and the, throughout the series will be the model checking problem. So we'll be mostly focused on, the, on this problem where the model checking problem is this, the following. You have a fixed formula phi, a sentence. So it's a sentence of some logic and you're given a graph and you want to know whether the sentence holds in the graph or or not. So phi expresses some property. So for example, here are some properties which you can express in first order logic. For example, uh, G has a clique of size three, so a triangle. So you can express this by the formula X, exists X, exists Y, exists Z, such that they are all connected, mutually connected. So X is adjacent to Y and X is adjacent to Z and Y is adjacent to Z. So this expresses, this is a first order formula which expresses that G has a clique. Similarly, you can write that G has a four clique. Um, so you have, you write the same thing, but you add more of those relations here. So you need to add stuff about being adjacent to T. Um, and so those are some examples. So, so in a similar way, you can express that G has a K clique for any fixed K. So this is a property which can be expressed by first order formula, but the size of the clique needs to be fixed. Here's another first order formula. G has a dominating set of size three. This means that there are three vertices such that uh, every vertex 
is either equal, to, well, is one of them or is adjacent to one of them. So, so it's either is equal to T or is adjacent to T or is equal to, uh, sorry, Y or is adjacent to Y or is equal to Z or is adjacent to Z. So, so this means that there are three vertices such that every other vertex is a neighbor of one of them. So this is a dominating set of size three. Similarly, you can say that G has a dominating set of size four. This can be expressed by a first order formula. Their first order logic is quite limited. So it cannot express some very simple properties like G has an even number of vertices. The graph G has an even number of vertices. You cannot express this in using a first order formula. Uh, you cannot just even explain, express this even if G is just a set without any edges or that a graph G is connected. You cannot express this by a first order formula, but you can express it in a more powerful logic, which is called uh, second order logic or G is two colorable or G is three colorable. Those things are not definable in first order logic, but they're definable in MSO, here's a formula of MSO, so monadic second order logic, which expresses that the graph G is three colorable. So it says there are sets of vertices. So now R, the quantifiers can range over sets of uh, vertices rather than single vertices. And then you can have quantifiers which range over single vertices. And so you have, you, you say there are sets of vertices, red, green, and blue, such that every vertex is either red or green or blue and exactly one of those and no two adjacent vertices have the same color. So the, when, when two vertices are adjacent, they are never both red or, or and they are never both blue and they are never both green. So this is a formula which is not first order logic, it's monadic second order logic which can express that G is three color. But in this uh, talk and in the series, we, we will fo focus on first order logic. So this is a, will be our main focus. This is first order model checking. So let's have a look at, um, so we're considering this first order model checking problem. So Again, we're given a formula. So we're sorry, we, we fix a formula. For example, a formula like this. And we're given a graph G and want to decide whether phi holds in G. And so form, the formula phi is fixed. And the naive algorithm, well, the way it works, so we're, we're th considering the computational complexity of this, how to evaluate such a formula. And the naive algorithm, you simply treat each quantifier as a loop. So we have a loop which ranges over all vertices of G. And then you have a nested loop, which ranges over all vertices of G. And then you have another nested, nested loop which ranges over all vertices of G and another one. So I'm, I'm writing an algorithm for this formula. And this formula essentially is an algorithm if you treat it as four nested loops. And in the end, you need to look, do some lookup. So this is, you just test this. So this naive algorithm has time. Uh, it has running time. Well, in this case, it's the size of number of vertices to the power four, because there are four nested loops in this formula. Well, in general, uh, if you have an arbitrary formula phi, the running time will be size of the number of, number of vertices to the, mm, the size of the formula. Um, I will. Okay, so this is the running time. And the problem is that this exponent phi, even if phi is, let's say, 
a small formula with 10 variables, but G has a million vertices, this is 1 million to the power 10, which is completely impractical. So that's the uh, motivation. Um, so the motivation is to get rid of this dependency on phi and have something like some function of phi to the power of some constant, like some small constant, like two or one. That would be an ideal algorithm. Uh, but well, the naive algorithm works in this time. And in particular, uh, well, there's a reason for this. Even if you're just interested in finding a clique of size k, the best known algorithm for deciding the existence of a clique of size k has essentially this running time. So it's the size of the graph roughly to the power k, something linear in k. Okay, so this is the best known algorithm for ex the existence of a k clique. So essentially, well, okay, you can do better than the naive algorithm, but the naive algorithm, it just looks for one candidate of the vertex and then for another candidate, and then it, it looks for all possible k vertices and tests whether this is a clique. This is the naive algorithm uh, for the existence of a clique. It runs in this time, size of g to the power k, where k is the size of the clique. And uh, that you can improve this uh, by some linear constant in the exponent, uh, but not by much. And there is a conjecture that you cannot get rid of this dependency on k in the exponent. So there is a conjecture which says that there is no algorithm which has a running time like this, so that the, the exponent does not depend on the size of the clique. Uh, so this is for the k clique. Oh, and this is okay. So even if you just consider the problem of the existence of a k clique, the best known algorithm has this running time, and it is conjectured that there is no algorithm which whose running time is like this. So the size of the graph to the power of some constant like two or three or five or a thousand, but which does not depend on k times some function, uh, some computable function of k. So it is conjectured that this such an algorithm for the k-peak problem. For example, it's conjectured that there's no algorithm with running time two to the power two to the power two to the power two to the power k times the size of g to the power seven. So no algorithm with such a running time for the k clique uh, is believed to exist. This is the con this conjecture is called W one is not included in the FPT because a running time of this form is called FPT. So it's called fixed parameter. If you have a running time like this, you're called the the problem is called fixed parameter tractable. So it is conjectured that the clique problem is not fixed parameter tractable. And this is this conjecture, W1 is not included in FPT. It implies P is not equal to NP because if, if P is equal to NP, then you can just compute the size of the largest clique in polynomial time. And then you have just simply size running time G to the power of C without this F of K dependency. Uh, but it's also implied by the exponential time hypothesis, which is some strengthening of um, the P versus NP, P not equal NP conjecture, which says that you cannot solve SAT in sub-exponential time, essentially. So, um, so this conjecture says that you cannot solve clique by, if, well, the clique problem is not fixed parameter tractable. In particular, this means that the conjecture says that there's no algorithm. So the model checking problem is not, is not first fixed parameter tractable. Because if you could solve the model checking problem in time, func some function of the formula times size of the graph C, 
So this means there's no algorithm with such a running time for the model checking. Well, because if you could solve this problem in this time, then you could solve the click problem in this time. And this is conjecture not to be not to be the case. Okay, so in general, it is conjectured that you cannot solve the model checking problem with such a running time. And the point of those uh, of, of those talks in the following three days is to show that you can achieve this running time if you know something about the graph G, that it comes from some well-behaved class of graphs. Okay, so maybe I'll move this a bit. So, okay, to wrap up what I've said so far, in general, we believe that there is no algorithm for the model checking problem with such a running time. But as I will show you, we will show you in the last in following three days, we will see that for special graphs, you can achieve such a running time. So for some graphs, which are somehow well-structured. By the way, are there any questions? If there are any questions, please feel free to interrupt me uh, right away. Just don't bother raising your hand or something like that because I might not notice that. So just uh, speak up. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the goal. Goal, FPT algorithm for FO model checking on restricted graphs. So for example, if the class of graphs is a tree, if you consider just trees here, then we will see that you can actually achieve this running time with C equals one. And more generally, for all those classes over here, planar graphs, bounded tree with bounded genus, excluded minor, and so on, we will have an algorithm for the model checking problem, which runs in time f, some function of the formula times the size of the graph g to the power one. So this will be fixed parameter tractable, the model checking problem. Okay, so that's the goal of, of, uh, of those top talks. And um, okay, let's, let's uh, move to it. So th those are called algorithmic meta theorems. So this, the theorem says, well, a statement of the form, model checking is fixed parameter tractable. Oops. If the formula is a first order formula and the graph G belongs to a class of some special form. For example, if G is a class of all trees, then this model checking problem is fixed parameter tractable. And this is called an algorithmic, or maybe let's give another. So for all of those classes, this will be true. Planar graphs, bounded degree, exclude minor, bounded expansion, and so on. And this is called an algorithmic meta theorem because uh, if you take, it, it, it solves many algorithmic problems at once. It solves the clique problem for every K, fixed K. So the existence of a three clique, the existence of a four clique, the existence of a five clique and so on. It solves the dominating set problem for any fixed K. It solves any problem which you can express by first order lo logic. So this is like, it solves a whole family of problems. Any, any property that you, know, you can express in first order logic, you can, uh, from this, those theorems, it follows that you can solve them on those classes of graphs efficiently. So it doesn't only solve, say, the click problem, but it also solves the dominating set problem and so on. So that's why it's called a meta theorem. It solves many problems at once for various graph classes. So if you're interested in classes of bounded degree, you know that any property that you can express in first order logic can be solved efficiently 
on graphs of bounded degree. Here's another example of a, so the, all those results are algorithmic meta theorems. Here's another example of a algorithmic meta theorem, which is for the more powerful logic, which is monadic second order logic, which I mentioned, where you can quantify over sets of vertices. And uh, similarly for any property which you can express in monadic second order logic, like three colorability, four colorability, connectivity, and so on. Uh, each of those problems can be solved with this running time, FPT running time, on classes of bounded tree width or classes of bounded clique width. Those are results due to Coursell. So those are the archi uh, uh, well, the archetypal um, meta theorems, those two results of Coursell for classes of bounded tree width and bounded clique width, and they talk about MSL logic. But in, this, uh, in those uh, lectures, we will focus on first order logic. And so for first order logic, we, we can consider more general, so the, the logic is less powerful. So this is uh, less powerful than MSO. So the logic can express less, but on the other hand, we can consider bigger classes of graphs more general classes of graphs. Okay, so let's look at, at an example of a very simple meta theorem. Well, the theorem will say that any first order property which you can express in first order logic, any property which you can express in first order logic can be solved in linear time on graphs without edges. So here's a graph without edges. It has uh, nine vertices. And I want to solve some fixed first order formula on this graph. So this for first order formula just can talk about equality and inequality. So it's a rather trivial formula. And well, as we said, the naive algorithm would first scan through all possible x's that would take uh, well, if there are n vertices, this loop will take n time n. Then we have another loop scanning through all vertices, another loop, and another loop. So the naive algorithm executes, uh, well, tests this formula in time n to the four. But you can see that due to the symmetries, you don't have to really scan through all possible vertices x because they're all the same. So instead of writing doing exist x, we can just write x equals one. We can just take the first vertex. It's as good as any other vertex. So now we have a nested subformula, say for all y, and instead of testing all vertices y, we can just test, well, there are essentially two cases, either y is equal to x, we have to check this case. This is, it might be important for the sub formula. So we, we tested only for y equals one and two. Either y is equal to x or is different from x. Okay, so we've reduced the second, the range of the second quantifier to just two elements. And then, and we continue in this way. So instead of testing all vertices z, we test just three possibilities for Z, either it's one or two or three. And then uh, the last one, similarly, uh, we check for T equals one, two, three, or four. Either it's equal to X or it's equal to, uh, well, I could have even written it in a maybe more uh, optimal way. But uh, in any case, the point is then we, we check the subformula. The point is that instead of doing n times n times n times n uh, checks, we just do uh, something like four factorial checks independently of n. So, so we've reduced our running time from n to the fourth down to four factorial. I'm cheating a bit here because you need to uh, 
you, it's not really four factorial. You have to know whether the, the structure has at least four vertices. So first you have to count the number of vertices in the graph. If it doesn't have four vertices, then some of those cases disappear. So the algorithm has running time. Well, the, the algorithm proceeds as follows, count the number of vertices and then uh, execute the scheme in time four factorial. But so it's essentially, well, it's roughly constant time up to the issue of counting how many vertices there, there are. And depending on your computation model, you can do this in constant time or in linear time. But anyway, in any case, we get time, which is O of N. Well, times some function depending on the formula phi. So F of phi, in this case, it's like size of phi factorial times number of vertices. Okay, so we've solved, uh, we showed, uh, we just showed that for edgeless graphs, model checking is FPT. And this was, of course, a very trivial example. Let's uh, move to a slightly more complicated example. Here's another class of graphs, disjoint unions of cliques. So here's an example of a disjoint union of cliques. It's like a, it's a four clique and a four clique and a four clique. It's, it's, this is all one graph. Then there's a clique of size 100 and a clique of size 1000. And then we want to test some formula in this graph. Okay, so now there are, it's not so easy as previously. Previously, we could just say, okay, X might as well be the first vertex. But now there are a couple of types of vertices. So there are ver vertices whose equivalence class has size uh, one, for example, this and this. Uh, there are vertices whose equivalence class or well, connected component has size two. There are vertices whose connected components has size three. There are vertices whose connected components has size four. And there are vertices which have, whose connected component has size bigger than five. So vertices in here and here. And you may observe that even those, those, those vertices are not exactly identical, that there's no isomorphism which maps a vertex which belongs to the K6 to a vertex which belongs to the K100. From the perspective of this formula, which has just four variables, four quantifiers, a vertex in a clique, clique of size six is just as good, good as a vertex in a clique of size 100. So basically, you can just consider, in this case, five types of vertices. And it's enough to, you don't have to loop over all possible possibilities for X. You can take just one vertex from here, a test vertex from here, a test vertex from here, from here, from here. So you need to check six possibilities for X, maybe five. I don't know why it's six, whatever, five or six. Uh, and then when you go for the Y vertex, it's similar. It's either, there are two cases, either Y is in the same connected component as X. Well, either Y is equal to X. That's one possibility. Or Y is different from X, but it's in the same connected component. It's adjacent to X. That's another second option. So if X was here, X is now, X is now fixed. So let's say X is, X is this, this guy over here. So then Y, we can check this possibility for Y or this possibility for Y. And then the other options are that Y is not in the same connected component as X. And again, we have several options depending on the size of the connected component for Y. So either Y has a connected component of size one, or it has connected component of size two, or bigger than five. So again, we don't need to check 1,107 1, options for 
for y, we just need to check one, two, and maybe five over here. So altogether, seven possibilities for y. And this continues in this way. So we have an exist x and for all t. So for this specific formula, we could have done it in a, a much simpler way than the naive algorithm. And um, well, let's not count the exact running time, but I think it's gonna be a, again, a constant running time. No, well, it's not constant running time. Now, now we have to count the sizes of the connected components. Previously, you had to count the, the size of the graph. Now you have to si count the sizes of the connected components and, and uh, you can do that in linear time. And then your algorithm can be evaluated in time. Well, some function of phi times the number of vertices of G. So again, we can do FPT time for any first order formula, not just this specific one, on graphs which are disjoint unions of cliques. Are there any questions so far? So this is hopefully, it's just, it's quite vague, but uh, I wanted to convey the intuition. How you can improve the naive algorithm by observing that many vertices behave in the same way. So you can prune many branches of your, of your algorithm. Okay, so let's get to some, uh, maybe some real theorem. Oh, I need to follow this, this path. Um, okay, here's a, this was a motivation for the following notion. This is, well, a classical notion from logic, which is called the type, the first order type of a given quantifier rank of a tuple. So if I have a tuple of vertices, like this one, I can, what is its type? So as previously, we saw that there are vertices of various type, either you're in a connected component of size one or a connected component of size two or of three, of size three or bigger than five. And this bigger than five, the reason why we put the threshold at five was that we were only interested in a formula of with five quantifiers. And because of that, we had five types of vertices or seven, some fixed number of vertices in disjoint unions of cliques. And this can be generalized by this notion of a type. So a type of a tuple of vertices, which is denoted the type of fixed quantifier rank, there's a fixed parameter Q, which is a num number. So it's essentially the number of quantifiers that we're interested in is just the set of formulas which are satisfied by this tuple. So, uh, oh, and those formulas are supposed to be of this quantifier rank. Of quantifier rank Q. The quantifier rank of a formula is the maximal depth of nesting, nesting of quantifiers. So this formula, uh, so this is number of nested quantifiers. So for example, this formula uh, has quantifier rank uh, three has three nested quantifiers, but I could also put another quantifier here, uh, which does something. But this quantifier is not nested be below this z, so this formula still it's only nested be below x and uh, those two quantifiers here. So this formula still has quantifier rank three. Okay, so we consider formulas of quantifier rank at most Q, like this. And we look at all such formulas which are satisfied by our, by our tuple. Okay, so let's uh, see an example. If I have 
two variables, x and y. What are the possible types of quantifier rank zero? Those, those are called the atomic types. Where in graphs, in graphs, either we can have x is equal to zero, or we can have x is not equal to zero, and x is adjacent to y. That's another possible type of quantifier rank zero. Or we have x is not equal to y and x is not adjacent to y. So we have two, three types of possible interactions, quantifier free interactions between two possible ver two vertices, x and y. Either they're equal or they're not equal and adjacent and, or not equal and non-adjacent. There are three types. Types of quantifier rank zero. of pairs of vertices. And maybe let's make some more space here. If I'm interested in quantifier rank one, to give a more, more interesting example, well, we can have more involved things. Let's say what we can say is like, for example, x is not equal to y, but they have a common neighbor. Uh, there is a z which is adjacent to x and adjacent to y. Okay, and they have a common non-neighbor, let's say. Or I can express things like there's a z which is adjacent to x, and non-adjacent to y. So I can describe this possible, there are several options of how x and y relate by what are the possible first order uh, interactions between x and y of, with one nested quantifier. So there exists a z which is a common neighbor and there is a z which is common, which is a neighbor of one of them, but not a neighbor of one. So this is how a type of quantifier rank one looks like. So we describe all those things, all those possible, there's a bounded number of them. So maybe let's draw some more. So here's one type. Okay, so I'll maybe do this in a more systematic way. So for example, for vertices, which are non-adjacent, There are types which express the existence of a vertex like this, there exist, which is adjacent to both of them, the existence of a vertex like this, which is adjacent to one of them, and the existence of a vertex like uh, this, which is adjacent to the other one, and the existence of a vertex like this, which is adjacent to none of them. And one, uh, a type needs to specify all of those things. So it can say, for example, this exists, this exists, this exists, and this exists. So that's one possible type. So this, this is a first order formula. It says there exists a guy like this, a guy like this, like this, like this, and so on. Another possible type would be like, say there does not exist a guy like this, a guy like this exists, a guy like this exists, but still, you can see there are finitely many possible types of interactions between X and Y. Okay, so this is a fact. There are finitely many possible types for any fixed number of variables. And quantifier rank. Okay, so this is an easy fact. We can do that in the exercises. Um, how am I with the time? Mm. Okay, yeah, I'm, uh, this is the middle of my time and 
Okay, so this is a very important tool. You, you probably know it from, uh, from logic. And so this is the general idea behind accelerating the naive algorithm. When you have a formula which you want to evaluate, you view it as this nested loops, but instead of quantifying over all vertices each time, you just quantify over types. So instead of quantifying over all possible vertices, you can just quantify, uh, well, X has type one or X has type, let's say, let's call those types tau one of X or X has type tau two of X or, and so on. Okay. Um, and if you know what are the types which can occur in your graph and you can explicitly list those types, then you've decreased the range of this quantifier here from ranging over all vertices to just a list of several options either X is of this type or is of this type or of this type. And you can do the same thing for Y. So either X, Y has type tau some like this or and so on. So you can decrease the range of the second quantifier and so on. You could proceed in this way and accelerate your algorithm. But to do so, you need to be able to find all the types of vertices which can occur in your graph. So you, can need, you need to understand the types which, which appear in your graph too. So uh, the, the key tool for understanding types is called Ellen Feucht Fleisse games. And you probably know this, um, so, so if I want to, I want to figure out whether two tuples A and B have the same type of quanti of given quantifier rank Q. So fix Q. I want to know whether those two tuples have the same type, meaning whether they satisfy exactly the same formulas of quantifier rank Q. And this is you can do this by playing a game. So the game is played by two players, spoiler and duplicator. And it proceeds in rounds. And each, each round, spoiler picks a vertex, gives it a name. It, he picks a vertex in one of the graphs. And duplicator needs to respond with a vertex in the other graph. So for example, if spoiler picks a vertex here, then duplicator needs to respond with a vertex here. And the property that those his response need to, needs to satisfy is that the three vertex, vertices, which are uh, marked in the left graph and the three vertices which are marked in the right graph need to have the same atomic type. So they need to satisfy exactly the same quantifier free formulas or in other words, those two structures induced by A1, A2 and A3 and B1, B2, B3 need to, those two subgraphs need to be isomorphic by a graph, by a map, by an isomorphism which maps A1 to B1 a2 to B2 and A3 to B3. So spoiler picks a vertex in one graph, duplicator responds so that the, the two subgraphs are isomorphic and the game continues for altogether for Q rounds where Q is the, the, the number that the quantifier rank we're interested in. <clears throat> so in the next round, say spoiler can pick a vertex here and then duplicator responds with some vertex. And if he doesn't want to lose, he will respond with this vertex to show that those two graphs are essentially similar. Okay, so in general, in round, in round E, spoil I, spoiler picks a vertex in either of the graphs, G or in H, and then uh, re duplicator responds. He picks a, a vertex in the other graph, 
And the chosen vertices are appended to the tuple of vertices that we're constructed, constructing. And duplicator must maintain that those two um, tuples of vertices have equal atomic types. So the after each round. So that's the definition of the game. And if spoiler, so, um, so the theorem is due to Adam Feucht and Fleissen, that duplicator does not lose after Q rounds, starting from a graph G with some tuple of vertices and a graph H with some tuple of vertices. So duplicator can, can uh, avoid losing for Q rounds if and only if the two tuples satisfy exactly the same formulas of quantifier rank Q. So we will use this notation that uh, in this case, if those two tuples satisfy exactly the same formulas of quantifier rank Q, meaning that, which is the same as saying A and B have equal types. So this is by definition of quantifier rank Q. We can write this this way, A and B are equivalent with this Q index here. So intuitively, two tuples, one in one graph, are Q equivalent is roughly, it's like an approximation of the statement that there is an isomorphism which maps one graph to the other and maps the first one tuple, the first tuple to the other tuple. Okay, so if there is such an isomorphism, then clear, then surely those two tuples are Q equivalent. But this is a weaker notion. So th there might not be such an isomorphism, but still the tuples are Q equivalent. So for example, those graphs are quite similar. They're not isomorphic, uh, but they're, they're not isomorphic, but the two tuples or the, the two original tuples, A1, A2, those two vertices. So A1, A2 and B1, B2 are equivalent if you just look at I think quantify up to formulas of quantifier rank two. Okay, so you can you can prove this by describing a strategy for duplicator, how to avoid losing for two rounds. So the strategy basically is if spoiler picks a central vertex, then duplicator responds with the central vertex. If spoiler rep replies with a leaf here, then duplicator re replies with a leaf here. And then if spoiler re replies with another leaf, then duplicator needs to reply here and he can avoid losing for two rounds, but he cannot avoid losing for three rounds. And the reason is that, uh, well, there, there are two ways of seeing this. First, there is a formula with, of, uh, with three quantifiers or of quantifier rank three, which distinguishes those two graphs. And the formula says that there are three vertices, one, two, three, which are uh, form an independent set and they are non-adjacent. So they are mutually non-adjacent and they're not non-adjacent to A1 and A2. But here in the second graph here, we cannot find three vertices, which are mutually non-adjacent and non-adjacent with B1 and B2. So there's a formula with three quantifiers, which uh, holds in one, of the graphs and not in the other graph. So this, this witnesses that those two tuples have different quantifier rank three types. And you can also see the strategy of spoiler to exhibit this, to, to force duplicator to do a losing move. So spoiler will play here. Sp duplicator will probably respond here then spoiler will play here, duplicator will maybe respond here, and then spoiler will play here, 
And then whatever duplicator chooses will be adjacent to either B1, to one of those vertices, B3, B4, or B1. So he will lose because all those vertices A3, A4, uh, A5 are non-adjacent. So this shows in two ways that those two tuples are not equivalent with respect to the equivalence of quantifier rank three. Okay, so this was the result of uh, an infoid phrase and let's uh, move on to some more, okay, so some more elaborate tools. So this tool is called the decomposition method. And this is basically the method used by Coursel in his theorem. And so the, um, okay, so maybe let's move this here. Before I do this, imagine we have a graph G. Oh, so by the way, I said, I defined what is the quantifier rank Q type of a tuple in a graph. But you can also say, what is the quantifier rank Q type of the graph itself with no tuple, with the empty tuple? Is the set of sentences of quantifier rank Q, which hold in Q, in G. Okay, so we can look at the type of a graph. So for example, this graph and this graph will have equal types up to quantifier rank, maybe four or something like this. Okay, so they, ha they have the same type and this they also have the same type as a graph with more vertices, a star like this. But they pr probably have different type than the star with three vertices. If you look at quant four quantifiers. Okay, so what's the decomposition method? The decomposition method says that if you know the type of quantifier rank Q of a graph G, and you know the quantifier rank Q type of a graph H, then you, then you can deduce the quantifier Q type of the disjoint union of G and H. So, okay, what does this mean formally? So require, recall that there are just finitely many types, finitely many possible types of a given quantifier rank. So this thing is a member of a set of finitely many types of quantifier rank Q. And this set, this element, the type of this graph H is a set, is an element of the same set. And the statement is that if you know those two elements, then you can deduce, then you can compute out of this, the type of the disjoint union. So here's the statement. The, type, the quantifier rank Q type of a digit union of G and H of rank Q depends only on the types of G and of H of the same quantifier rank Q. Depends only means formally that there is a function which allows you to determine this type from those two types. So there's a function FQ from this set of possible types of quantifier rank Q times this set to the set itself, such that, and recall this is a finite set. There are just finitely many possible types of, em well, empty tuples. So single so graphs, entire graphs. Um, such that the type of the disjoint union of G plus H is the result of this function applied to those two types. Another way of phrasing is that, is the following, if you have two graphs, G and H, the G and G prime 
which have the same type. So they're very similar. And H and H prime have the same type. So let's say G is something like this and G prime is something like this. So they are very similar. And then H and H prime are also very similar to each other. So maybe like this. They're quite similar to each other. Then it follows that the disjoint union of those two things. So this is H, this is H prime is very similar to the disjoint union of those two things. So that's uh, the statement. Well, and the proof is proceeds by playing the EF, the Aaron for each price A game. So we want to show that duplicator. So we have G and G prime, and they're equivalent, very similar, and H and H prime are very similar. So this means that in, th in those two graphs, duplicator has a strategy where he can avoid losing for Q rounds. And in those two gra graphs, duplicator also has a strategy where he can avoid losing for two rounds. Now we want to describe a strategy for duplicator in the disjoint union of those two graphs. And the strategy is as follows. So if spoiler plays in G, then duplicator responds according to his strategy in G and G prime. And if spoiler, so then the game may continue. So for instance, spoiler plays a pebble here, duplicator replies here, then spoiler plays a pebble here, then duplicator responds here. Um, and then if uh, spoiler plays in the second H or H prime, then let's say here, then duplicator responds to his strategy in the pair H and H prime. And spoiler can play an alternation between the two graphs, but it's like playing simultaneous chess on two boards simultaneously. So uh, duplicator has a strategy to win here for Q rounds. He has a strategy to win here for Q rounds. So he can, has a strategy to win on the, the disjoint unions for Q rounds. And the key point is that there is no interaction between those two games because there are no, no edges between G and G prime. So whenever those two structures here are isomorphic and those two structures here are isomorphic, which duplicator can maintain because he can avoid losing for Q rounds, then the disjoint, the, the structures induced by on the left side, this is, oh, sorry, this is, let's say, the disjoint union of those two structures in, induced by the pebbles here and here are also isomorphic because there are no edges here and here. Okay, so that's the composite. Um, um, let's have a simple application of this composition method. So observe that there's a, a, also a trivial observation, much simpler, is that if we know all the formulas so let's say G C is the edge complement of a graph. So this means that we replace edges by non-edges and vice versa. So the edge complement of this graph is this graph. So if you know what formulas hold in a graph G, then of course you also know what formulas hold in the complement because you just replace in the formulas, you replace edge by non-edge by the negation. So the type of quantifier rank Q of the edge complement of a graph G only depends on the type of quantifier rank G, uh, Q of G. So there's a function which allows you to compute one type for, of the complement from the type of the graph. And now you can comp compose those two functions. So we had a function which allowed you to do disjoint union, and we have a function which allows to do complement. So we get the following corollary. 
If we have a graph which can be constructed out of single vertices using disjoint unions and edge complementation, then we can compute the type of any given quantifier rank of the whole graph. So here's a, here's a graph. We start with vertices, two vertices here, the blue vertices, and we take the disjoint union. This is this graph here. Then we take, here's the complement. The complement of this graph is this graph. Simultaneously, we can construct the disjoint union of two vertices here and take its disjoint union. Then we can take the disjoint union of those two graphs, which is just a graph which consists of two edges. And then we can take the complement, which is the square. So this graph has been constructed. The square can be constructed out of single vertices using two operations, disjoint union and complement. And it follows from what we was said above uh, that we can compute, if we have such a graph and such a decomp term constructing this graph using disjoint union and, and um, complementation, then we can compute the quantifier rank um, Q type of the graph G in linear time. How do we do this? Well, we start with the vertex at the bottom and a vertex has some fixed type. So recall that we're in, we fix some quantifier rank Q. And now we're looking at types of quantifier rank Q. And there is a fixed, a single vertex is a graph with one single vertex and it has some fixed quantifier rank Q type. And then we take the disjoint union. So this is by applying our function FQ to two of those types. And we can call this type, let's say tau one. And we can compute this type by applying this function to this type tau zero. But recall that this type tau zero is an element of a finite set And this function is a function from a finite set times a finite set to a finite set. And this set finite set is fixed. It only depends on the, quantif on the rank Q. So we can compute this type in constant time if we treat Q as a fixed number. So here we can compute the type here again, and then we can compute the complement type by using the complementation. So we have this complementation function applied to tau one. And we, we have the complement type here, and then we can apply, compute the type, let's say tau two, which is the type of this, those two edges. Again, we apply the same function FQ to tau one C and tau one C. We do this again in constant time. And then in the end, we apply complementation again, and we do it by applying the other function in constant time. So by applying those um, two functions, depending on the type of operation which was performed, disjoint union or complement, we can compute by processing the tree from leaves to the root, the type of the whole graph of any fixed quantifier rank Q. So Q is fixed. So the Okay, so there's something uh, maybe might be confusing here. So we fix the quantifier rank Q and hence the set delta Q of types, set of types of quantifier rank Q of empty tuples. That means we were looking at a type of a graph together with an empty tuple in this graph. This set is finite. And we have those two functions, FQ and CQ, which we therefore assume we can 
since those are two functions on finite sets, we assume we can evaluate them in constant time. But uh, we should remark that this set of types is, is very big depending on Q. It has size, it's finite, but has size something like two to the two to the two to the, and so on up to Q. And this is a tower of size Q. So it's a huge number for any fixed quantifier in Q, but it's still finite. So this is, uh, it's, it's, uh, looks like cheating and it is in a sense. So in the end, we get an algorithm which computes the type of the whole graph in time, well, we said linear, but it's time two to the two to the two to the two to the size of Q times number of vertices of G. This is the running time of our, our algorithm, roughly. Um, yes, but still, this is what is called FPT. So this is not practical for uh, in any sense, but um, in any practical sense, but it's fixed parameter tractable. So we can compute this in linear time in terms of the size of the graph. And once we compute, uh, the type, we can decide whether a given formula holds in the graph or not, because we have also a function, let's say, uh, i sub phi, which given a type answers zero or one, depending on whether the formula phi, the sentence phi belongs to the type or not. We call it a, formally a type is a set of sentences of quantifier rank Q, and we just look up whether this sentence belongs to the type or not. So in the end, once we have this type of the whole graph, we can apply this function i of phi, and this is either zero or one, depending on whether g satisfies not phi or g satisfies phi. So we can decide whether g satisfies phi or not in linear time. So how do we pick our quantifier rank Q? This is in the beginning, if we want to determine whether a sentence phi holds in the graph, we fix Q equal to be the quantifier rank of the form. Okay, so that's an algorithm which runs, which runs in linear time on graphs, which can be um, constructed using disjoint union and complementation. And uh, such graphs are called co-graphs. But this is provided that the graph is given together with a, with a term constructing the graph using disjoint union and complementation. And then to complete, and this is a key part of many um, algorithms, we need an argument which says that if we want to say that for all co-graphs, so graphs which can, can be composed out of uh, single vertices using a disjoint union and complement, we can do model checking in FPT time. We need to, uh, to finish this argument, we need to have an algorithm which given a co-graph G computes a term defining this graph G. Because a graph is not usually given together with the term describing the construction of this graph but it's just a graph. And the first thing we need to do, given a graph, is compute this term. Given a co-graph, we need to compute this term. So for this, we need a lemma which says that there is an algorithm, a polynomial time algorithm, which given a co-graph computes a term defining this co-graph in polynomial time. So we can do this uh, in the exercise session. Uh, and from this, combining the two, we deduce that first order model checking is fixed parameter tractable on the class of all co-graphs. How does the algorithm work? You're given a co-graph. We compute, compute a term uh, defining G where a term is 
using disjoint union and complementation, then we fix, so we have a formula sentence phi, which we want to model check on the graph G. And then we fix Q to be equal to the quantifier rank of phi. And then eval we compute the type of quantifier rank Q of G in a bottom up fashion. Using the two functions, the two functions F, Q, and CQ. And once we compute the this type, we can also compute. In the end, we, we can determine whether the sentence phi belongs to this type or not. So output true if phi belongs to this type and false otherwise. So that's the algorithm. Okay. And that's a rough sketch of the proof of this theorem and an illustration of this composition method. Okay, so um, this composition method can be extended in multiple ways. Here's one possible way is instead of taking disjoint union, we can take a sort of an amalgamated union. So we have two graphs, G and H. And here we have two vertices, S1 and, S1 and S2. And here we have two vertices also denoted S1 and S2. And we take this amalgamated union along S1 and S2. And it's essentially like the disjoint union, but then we say, that this vertex S1 is actually equal to this vertex S1 here, and this vertex S2 is equal to the ver vertex S2 here. So it's like a disjoint union, but apart, uh, oh, something disconnected. After taking the disjoint union, you identify two of those vertices from here with two vertices from here. So, um, and this, Proof using the Aaron Foy Fries again extends to showing that the type of this amalgamated union depends only on the type of the left graph together with those two vertices, S1 and S2. So this is the type of the elements, the vertices S1 and S2 in the graph G, and the type of the elements S1 and S2 in the graph H. And given those two types, we can compute the, the type of the two elements S1 and S2 in the resulting amalgamated union. It's basically the same proof. And using this observation, we can, um, we can extend our method above. Now we don't use complementation, we just use those amalgamated unions. And this leads to this, the following notion, which is called tree width. Oops. So many of you know this notion. My screen connection somehow uh, broke. But we can, we can see your, your screen. Oh, that's good, but, oh, but, okay. But not an hour. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I need to do share screen again. Screen room. Okay. So this is a definition, say that a graph G has tree width at most K, if it can be constructed out of graphs with distinguished tuples of at most K plus one, one vertices. 
um, where the graph base the basic building blocks are graphs of with at most k plus one vertices and at most k plus one of them are distinguished as constants so those are pairs graph with some vertices and you also use this operation of the amalgamated union where you only amalgamate two graphs where you have at most k plus one vertices distinguished here and at most one k plus one vertices distinguished here and you do an amalgamation where you amalgamate at most k plus one of those vertices so you identify at most k plus one vertices a subset of those k plus one vertices from the left with a subset of those k plus one vertices to the right so here's an example we start with a, this graph with three vertices where two of them are distinguished as uh, those two vertices, one and two, S1 and S2. Here's another graph. And we take the disjoint union, amalgamated union, where we amalgamate two with two. So here we get, and we, get, we forget this vertex number. Oh, sorry. And we forget the vertex number two. Okay, so what, what we amalgamate the two with two here, we then forget it and we leave this, this is indicated here. Okay, so this, is, maybe this notation might be confusing, but I hope this will be clear for, from this example. And now we only have two distinguished vertices, one and three. Now we take this operation applied to uh, one and four, so those two graphs. So we have this graph on the right and this graph on the left. We identify the common vertices in the le left and the right. So that's vertex number three. And then we only leave the vertices one and four as distinguished vertices. Then we repeat this. Uh, by adding this edge, this graph here. So we, the, the four has from here has been identified with the four with here, but then since the plus has a subscript one and five, we forget the four. And in the end, we add this edge. One and five. And we forget the vertices, uh, those forget vertices one and five, we have constructed a cycle of length, well, whatever it is, should be five, I guess, but I, it's somehow six. Um, okay, so in this way, using this one operation, we can construct, say, a cycle. So, so, the, so the cycle has tree width, according to this definition, it has tree width at most two, because we started with graphs with at most k plus one where k is equal to two vertices. And in the process, we in the subscripts, we only used at most three vertices as well, well, two in fact. So this cycle has three with two. By the way, a cycle of length five is not a co-graph, so it cannot be constructed using disjoint union and edge complementation. And using the same decomposition method, we get this, this corollary that given a graph G of tree with at most K, so a graph like this, together with a term constructing this graph, we can compute the type of given quantifier rank in linear time. But to get an FPT algorithm which works on all graphs of tree with at most K, we need an additional ingredient, which is an algorithm which given a graph of tree with at most K, constructs the term defining the graph, computes the term de defining G, the graph G. Because as previously, when you're given the graph G, you, it doesn't come with a decomposition, with a, with a term. So you need an additional combinatorial and algorithmic fact. And this, is, uh, uh, this will appear later on as well, that there are two components of a model checking algorithm. One is an algorithm which inputs some sort of tree-like decomposition and computes the type. 
And the other ingredient is, is given a graph, it computes the decomposition. So there's this ingredient is given by Bodlander's theorem, which says that there is an algorithm which given a graph G of tree with the most K computes a term which defines this graph G in linear time. So by composing this corollary with this theorem, we get the theorem of Coursell, which says that model checking first order logic is fixed parameter tractable on graphs of tree with the most K. In fact, it's some function well, always can be free. Some function of the formula and linear in terms of the size of the graph. Let's say G. Yeah, okay. Okay. So this is Coursell's theorem. And actually, Coursell proves this for the more powerful MSO logic, but the proof is very similar. So you can follow the same proof. It's also the decomposition method, but you need to develop Aaron Foyt Freise games for this more powerful logic, MSO. You, you, can, you can do this in, in the exercise. OK, so that was the decomposition method. I have a few minutes left. And um, now I wanted to go to move to another um, method, which is called the locality method. OK, maybe we'll, let's see. I will take 10 minutes more, and then I will stop. I will see how much I can say in 10 minutes. Basically, the locality method is it's based on the following observation. That if I have the same graph, let's say, G and G, and I have two vertices which have very similar neighborhoods, then, it will, then it's very difficult to distinguish those two vertices using a first order formula. So for example, those two vertices A and B, they're equivalent up to quantifier rank, say, three. You can prove this by playing the Aaron Foyt Freise game between A, A and B, G with A and G with B. So you can prove this by hand, but we want to have like a more general understanding of this, of this phenomenon. And this is encompassed by this notion of locality. So the Intuition is that the type of a tuple A of quantifier rank Q is essentially governed by two things. The local type, which tells you about how the neighborhood of the tuple looks like, let's say a single vertex, plus some global information about the whole graph. Okay, so the type of the tuple A or a single vertex, say, is determined by some local type. I need to define what a local type is and some global information about the whole graph. But in general, the, the, the global type doesn't distinguish the, 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 the tuple anymore. It talks only about the graph G without. So this, is, this talks about G and not the tuple A in particular, and the local type, intuitively it talks about the neighborhood of some fixed radius around the tuple in the, in the graph. So the subgraph induced by this neighborhood. So th this part talks about some local properties around the vertices in the tuple A, while this one ignores the vertices a whatsoever and only talks about the whole graph. Okay, so let's define the notion of a local type. So the local type, say that a local type, this is not slightly non-standard definition, but say that the local type of rank Q of a tuple A, well, what was the, the non-local type of rank Q of a tuple A? We looked at all formulas of quantifier rank or nesting quantifier nesting Q, which are satisfied by the tuple. Here, we will look at formulas with nesting Q, but you're only allowed to quantify around in, in the vicinity of something in the tuple that you're talking about. So let's say we're, we have a formula phi of x1, xk. And I'm allowed to, 
I, I can't quantify over the entire graph. So my quantifier doesn't range over the, the entire graph. It's restricted to the neighborhood of radius two to the power Q for some reason around the vertices that I'm talking about. And then I can talk, introduce a new quantifier, let's say T, and I can now quantify over a slightly smaller neighborhood, twice as small of radius two to the power of Q minus one, but around the vertices X1, XK, but also around the vertex Z, because I'm in this, this quantifier is in the scope of this quantifier. And we proceed in, in this way. So in general, if I have a quantifier at depth I, then the quantifier ranges over the neighborhood of the variables which are in the current context. So if I have a quantifier here, let's say U, then this quantifier is nested below, below some other quantifiers. So there are some variables in the context. This is T, this is Z, and also the variables X1 and XK. I look at this context and if the nesting depth of my quantifier is high, then I can only range, my, my variable needs to range around the neighborhood of those variables in this context. Uh, okay, so I look, look at restricted formulas of this form. And I look at all formulas of this form which hold of the given tuple. So the, quant the local type of rank Q of a tuple A bar is the set of all formulas of this form which are satisfied by this tuple. So note in particular, because of this decreasing, so this is notation N, okay, I should have introduced this notation, N of A1, AK is the radius R neighborhood of A1, AK. Okay, so if I have some vertices in a graph, I look at their neighborhoods and all, yeah, so this is A1, A2, A3, and this is the radius R neighborhood. So those are all vertices which are within distance at most R from one of those vertices A1, AK. So here we have, in particular, if you have the quantifier at depth Q, then the, the radius is equal to, um, well, if, if the quantifier has depth larger than Q, then the radius is smaller than one. And that, that means we cannot have more than Q nested quantifiers. So in particular, the formula needs to have at most Q nested quantifiers. Okay, so let's look at an example. Um, so in particular, if I have two vertices A and B in some big graphs, one is in a graph G and the other one is in a graph H, but those neighborhoods are isomorphic. So there's an isomorphism which maps one neighborhood to the other one and maps A to B. Then the two vertices have equal low. The neighborhoods should be isomorphic of radius, I think, Q to the power plus one, two to the power Q plus one. So if those neighborhoods are isomorphic, then they have, those two vertices have equal local types. Why is that? Well, my first quantifier is restricted to vertices within radius at most two to the Q around A. The next quantifier is restricted to vertices around with radius at most two to the Q minus one around the previously quantified vert vertex. The next one is has slightly smaller neighborhood, but altogether 
with those quantifiers, I cannot leave this big radius because two to the Q plus two to the Q minus one plus two to the Q minus two plus and so on plus one is, I guess, what, what is it equal to two to the Q? I'm plus one and uh, minus one. So it's smaller than two to the Q. So my quantifiers cannot escape, those restricted quantifiers cannot escape this, this ball. And since those neighborhoods are isomorphic, the local types will be equal. The same sets formulas will hold. Okay, and let's now formalize this statement that this intuition that I said earlier. And this intuition is formalized by the following theorem. If I fix a quantifier rank, And well, the number of variables that I'm interested in, so I'm interested in k tuples of elements, then there is some uh, other number q prime. You can think of this as this radius or something that governs the radius, such that whenever I have a graph G, the same graph, and two tuples, so it's the same graph G, and let's say a vertex here and a vertex here, and they have equal local types of rank Q prime, then actually they have equal types. So they're in the same graph G, their local types are equal. And the conclusion is that their full types are equal. Okay, and maybe let's just do uh, one three minute corollary of this. The corollary is the following theorem of set due to Seze, which says that model checking first order logic is fixed parameter on graph classes with bounded maximum degree. Why is that? Well, observe that if G has maximum degree, G is a graph where all vertices have degree at most D. And there are only a bounded number of, so let's say degree three. And now if you're looking at what are the possible isomorphism types of balls of radius R in a graph of degree at most three, well, there's only a finite number, well, at most D to something like R, many graphs of radius, maybe R plus one, many possible graphs, Anyway, there's a finite number of graphs of radius R and of maximum degree at most uh, D, which means that there's only a finite number of possible isomorphism types of balls of radius at most R. So in particular, there's, there's a bounded number of local types of vertices, at, at least at most th this many. And we can compute the set of representatives given a graph of de maximum degree at most D, we can compute a set of representatives of all local types um, of rank Q in linear time. We just need to look at all vertices in the graph G and look at what are their isomorphism types of, the, of radius two to the power Q plus one around those vertices. We can compute all those representatives. And this way we can simplify our na naive algorithm. So if we had, we wanted to evaluate a formula like this, instead of ranging over all vertices, let's say in the second round, instead of ranging over all vertices Y, we can only, we can restrict to all representatives of types of rank Q minus one. And there's a, so instead of ranging over all vertices Y, we just need to range over all representatives of vertices. And there's a bounded number of those representatives and we restrict our quant second quantifier to only those representatives. And in a similar way, we can restrict uh, the next quantifier to some representatives. And those are finite sets, sets of bounded size. So this first quantifier ranges over all vertices and the remaining ones range over sets of finite size. 
So altogether, our running time is size of V times some function of phi. This is a rough sketch of the theorem, the proof of the theorem of says. So model checking FO is fixed parameter tractable on graphs with bounded maximum degree. Okay, so we haven't proved this theorem. This relies on this theorem of Geifman. Uh, we will see this in the exercises. So um, let's stop here and we resume quarter past four. <laughs>